Welcome back to the studio, and we're in conversation the next 30 minutes with Nick Allardyce, CEO of Change.org. Uh, Nick, you started out as an activist, then you went to Change uh, to help with its global expansion, and then you also, I know, worked on the campaigns team and the product team, so know many aspects of the organization. Welcome to the program. I'm so excited to talk to you because we're here to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the global expansion of the organization, right? Yeah, we are. It's, uh, it's a really special year for us, actually, because it was 10 years ago that Change.org went from being this very US-centric uh, petition platform to really expanding globally. And most people may not realise, but signing petitions is the most popular civic action second only to voting. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in the 10 years since then, we've seen more than 500 million people use Change.org around the world to sign petitions on the things that they care about. Um, so much so that in a bunch of countries, whether it's the US or the UK or Spain, we have almost as many people using Change.org as voters, like more than 50% of the um, voting population are using Change.org on a regular basis. Um, and then just in the last couple of years, we expanded to Africa. And um, right now, actually, there's this, this massive campaign that's taken off in South Africa um, about energy and the energy crisis that's happening there. And so all around the world, we've seen this explosion of activity of people using this simple, accessible tool to take action on issues they care about. And we're taking this year as 10 years since we started that process to just celebrate that. Awesome. Now, with petitions, I think, um, how do you take a petition and, and see the impact you know, beyond the online signing? I mean, some people can be quite critical. It's just signing you know, putting your signature on something and then nothing happens after that. But what are you seeing? Yeah, so I think there's a little bit of a misconception that petitions don't work and that's not at all our experience. Mm. Um, literally every hour there are campaigns winning on the platform just through people adding their voice and telling their story through this very simple tool. Now, I think in some ways the advent of online organising came from the simple insight that signing a petition could also act as a sign-up form for further action. And so what we see is that petitions are, they're, they're kind of containers. Mm -hmm. They're a way in which a group of people who have a shared set of values or a shared goal can come together, but then organise together on what additional actions are going to make the most difference. And so frequently we see um, thousands of people come together within a petition, but then using that as a forum to identify what's the next action to take? Where are we meeting up in person? Who are we calling? Um, how are we lobbying the decision makers? And they're the campaigns that are most successful. Now, I think the problem is mm. uh, activism as a whole, and I've been working in activism and I guess volunteering in activism for uh, pretty much all of my life at this point, I think the same barriers exist today as have for a really long time, which is it takes a lot of time, mm. it takes a lot of money. Like, you've got to have the, like, privilege to be able to invest time in activism it, and organising. It often happens outside of somebody's job, right? Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and it requires a, you know, it's, it's not clear how it works. It's very inaccessible. Um, uh, it's not clear how to be successful. It requires education, knowledge, various things. And so we are constantly looking at, well, how can we make this more accessible? What are the barriers that we can lower by taking all of what we learn about what makes for effective campaigning, making that accessible to people through personal coaches, through um, training and education, but also exploring ways for people to be able to like earn money to be sustainable in their activism as well. So the petition is really very much a starting point. It's like a gateway drug. <laughs> a, a nice gateway drug. <laughs> exactly. Um, so what has changed over the last 10 years in terms of how you're seeing this process play out? Um, what was it like 10 years ago when people signed up for a petition and what happened versus now? And how are they using technology to leverage things? Yeah, so I think there's never been a better moment in time for people to have more agency and voice through using technology, whether petitions or actually social media and other technology evolutions, to organise quickly. And I think that like COVID actually provides a really good example of this. So. On Change.org, we saw this explosion of campaigns, like hundreds, thousands of campaigns looking at the advent of COVID, like how to protect and support different industries, 
hundreds, thousands of campaigns how to make sure that healthcare workers had access to PPE and other forms of security. Hundreds, thousands of campaigns around vaccine access and things like that. And that was a moment in time in which I think institutions were struggling to react fast enough. Like the, the centralised, coordinated approach to that rapidly changing environment mm. simply couldn't keep up with the set of needs. And so on change, we saw people like breaking that problem down into all of these different micro solutions and then organising around those. And we saw that happen off change as well, like mutual aid groups springing up and other forms of collective organising that involve individuals and communities self-organising to identify solutions and improve things. So super busy period the last two years, not much uh, bread baking for you. Definitely, probably. definitely been a busy few years. <laughs> Amazing. And so um, can you talk about what is uh, happening right now? Something that's coming up a lot in the last 24 hours of the summit is, of course, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, how are you seeing that play out on your platform? Yeah, so I don't know about you, but certainly around when that first happened, I felt this incredible sense of like powerlessness, frustration, anger. Like, yeah, absolutely. How I can mean, we do something? Like, what a awful situation. You're, you're just sitting there watching the tanks roll towards Kyiv and you're concerned that, I mean, there was a moment when everyone was concerned that the president of Ukraine was just going to be killed and we're all just watching. Absolutely. And so we saw this like explosion of people like trying to find a way to constructively challenge their like fear and hope mm -hmm. in that situation. Uh, so constructively channel, mm -hmm. not cha challenge. And uh, that led to a mixture of things. So you have these like one-off big breakout moments. So one example, in Russia, an anti-war activist started a petition that really ended up being a central focal point for anti-war um, uh, expression in Russia at the time. More than 1.2 million Russians signed that campaign um, and it became a mechanism and voice for people inside Russia to express their, um, their kind of frustration in this situation and, and oppose the war. But outside of that, we also saw this phenomenon of these like thousands of micro actions that people might take. So we saw thousands of campaigns that were about um, how can we uh, make it easier for refugees to get into this particular country? Um, we saw thousands of campaigns that were about welcoming those refugees or about ensuring that there was aid going to different groups. And so um, what we're seeing in response to moments like that is not one silver bullet campaign where people think that one particular movement or one particular petition or any one thing is going to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. I don't think people are that naive. Right. But what they are doing is they're trying to take that big problem, break it down into a whole bunch of smaller component bite-sized pieces that you can then make a difference on in your local community. And that, honestly, is the thing that gives me the most hope in those situations. I actually want to go back to one of the examples you gave of Russians signing a petition against the war. Here's a question. What about protecting those people and the security? I'm sure you guys think about, about it. People sign their names onto list. At the time, it made sense. And if they're in a semi-authoritarian state that decides to start going after people on that list, how does change deal with that challenge? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, we operate a, 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 across a bunch of different contexts, both democratic as well as semi-democratic, as yeah. well as kind of authoritarian. And so we have a set of protections in place in those markets mm. where we anonymise and make secure a bunch of the personal information. So whereas in a US market, what you might see is you see all the list of names and like that's right. people putting their public persona against a, a campaign. In Russia, what you would see is just the aggregate. Like you see the number of people taking action, but um, we, we kind of strip away the ability to identify any one person within it. Super interesting. The other thing that I'm wondering is, um, since a decade ago, my own observation is that um, activism happens in different countries, uh, but there's a transnational thing going on. Like, point of reference is um, in Asia with the Milk Tea Alliance. A funny name, but it was a way for young protesters, a lot of them students in Hong Kong, Myanmar, Thailand, Indonesia, mm -hmm. to start communicating with each other, um, to try to, you know, it's a strength and numbers thing that people were recognizing. Are you seeing more of that um, through change.org as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a really good example because I think 
looking 10 years ago, I think there may have been a optimism that there was the potential for these unifying transnational movements that would be like, you know, put pressure on international governments to see climate action and, you know, one big campaign might be a, um, a global cry to mm. um, force a change of some kind. Right. And that's not really how we're seeing it play out. We see transnational movements that share values and goals, but which take those values and goals and customise them for their local context and figure out what the right expression is for those contexts and that are inspired by each other and support each other with lessons, with learnings, with things like that, but which are not working on fundamentally the same specific campaign. An example of this would be in 2020, um, uh, we saw thousands of campaigns in the US focused on uh, representation around racial justice monuments. So thousands of monuments to slave owners in the US that were kind of held up and glorified in different local communities. And so we saw hundreds and thousands of campaigns that were about changing that representation and taking those down. That inspired a set of similar campaigns that basically started copycatting, copycatting and learning from what was happening that we saw spread across the world. In the UK, I remember, and... Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the same thing happened, another example, uh, in, many, uh, in many contexts, um, women's sanitary products are taxed uh, in a way. So tampon taxes is an example. Mm -hmm. And so we saw this big campaign in the UK where um, there was this huge movement that was about getting the tampon tax removed. That started before the United States, That right? did start before the United yeah. States, that's right. And that campaign very much inspired copycat campaigns across first across the rest of Europe and then on a state-by-state -state basis in the US. And those campaigners were talking to each other, right? There's like literally a WhatsApp group in which folks are sharing lessons, celebrating each other's victories and being inspired by what's working in different context contexts and countries. And that, I think, is the future of like transnational activism. It's not about one unifying big campaign that everyone is working on. It's about shared goals and shared values and then sharing lessons and being inspired by that and supporting each other in the way that it gets taken forwards. How is that different than, like, I'm, just as you're talking, I'm thinking about, like, the Arab Spring, where there was also transnational communication. How is it different now than uh, back then? I mean, I, you, you answered it a little bit about, you know, each group understanding that they have to focus on their own theme and their shared values, but are you seeing anything else in terms of, like, uh, how they implement technology or so on? Yeah, I mean, I think the themes are still there from the Arab mm -hmm. Spring, which is that, like, uh, decentralisation of communication enables that sharing of information and mm -hmm. that inspiration um, from each other. But the mechanisms through which that happens are changing. And so, uh, you know, these days, rather than necessarily Twitter being the thing in which the Arab Spring is, like, sharing that information, now you have a rise of, like, TikTok communicators who are... Um, uh, telling stories and figuring out how to make information about the Ukraine, like, digestible, easily accessible and distributable to a really large audience. And so I think the mechanisms are changing. I think things like WhatsApp, things like whether it's Discord or Slack that are enabling um, coordination across context and sharing of lessons mm -hmm. is new and evolving as well. Great. Uh, we're going to go to questions very soon. So if you haven't, um, you've been shy in the chat box, definitely start submitting your questions um, and we'll get to as many as possible. Uh, but I want to uh, maybe wrap up this part of the segment with a couple of big picture questions. Um, it's been a little depressing sometimes to see uh, people power movements essentially not work out. We see this with Hong Kong we saw that there was such an expectation from the people of Belarus that the world would stand with them. And to an extent they have, um, but they didn't get perhaps the kind of help they needed or in any case, the movement was crushed. Uh, you see this, it's just slightly different, but in Kazakhstan earlier this year, um, I can go on and on, right? Uh, in Southeast Asia, the Thai students came out during COVID and kept coming out. And so, I mean, it feels sometimes like none of it is working. As someone who uh, sits there and deals with all this, looks at the petitions, look at all the activism in all these different countries, um, what would you say? I mean, unfortunately, advocacy, activism, campaigning, it's just not a linear process. Um, my experience, I, I think back to one of the first big 
kind of organising efforts that I worked and volunteered on, which was about trying to increase Australia's um, aid and development budget. Uh, and after this blood, sweat and tears of nine months of campaign working on this, we secured a commitment to increase Australia's development budget by about $3 billion, which felt like this huge win. Right. Um, and then three years later, new government comes in, cuts it immediately. Right. And so it was just this devastating moment. And, and constantly, I think, advocacy and campaigning is very much two steps forward, one steps back. And you can never know when, a, when the groundwork that a campaign has laid can find fertile ground when context changes. Yeah, it often feels like it's happening very quickly, but actually totally. a lot of people have been investing decades in totally. sacrificing. Totally. I mean, I think you see in a bunch of countries right now what has felt like zero progress at all on climate. Mm -hmm. Suddenly context changes and something new is possible. The same is true actually on COVID, where for decades people had been working on mental health issues and then COVID put a focus on that that meant a huge number of national governments um, invested in mental health in a way that they had never done, done before. Right. And the only reason that was possible was because there'd been decades of pre-work that had felt like it wasn't going anywhere. Right, And right. then suddenly it was possible and there was this huge leap forwards. Excellent. Okay, so let's go to questions. Uh, we have one from Carolyn. How have you seen people use change.org to innovate beyond the traditional petition format? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, uh, one thing that we're seeing at the moment is the rise of what I will call the like individual civic leader influencer type. And what I mean by this is if we go back a few decades, uh, most organising and activism was, um, or much of it was led from within institutions, organisations, non-profits that were um, kind of building durable power and organising that on organising on that over time. And what we're seeing now is these individuals who are, have powerful personal stories, who are compelling communicators, and who have like really innovative theories of change and diverse ways of looking at a problem building audiences and brands almost like as individuals that are then being very compelling public communicators around it. Mm. Like the most obvious example is like Greta at an at a international level. Right. But I think across every issue, you're seeing more and more of these people who are building an audience as an individual, finding their voice um, and having an incredibly important impact on the way that the public is perceiving an issue. And so petitions are like one way to build that audience and right. to start to um, cut through. Um, but people are then leveraging that audience into things like additional actions that their supporters can take. One thing that we're working on is how people can take that and, and turn that into having durable income, actually, because the biggest um, barrier to being able to do more of that work right. is like time and money. Right, we back to what you said at the very beginning. Exactly. Yeah. So that's something that we're working on as well and that's something we're very excited about. Cool. Awesome. So, next question. Uh, what has change.org learned um, and shared about the impact of petitions and other advocacy tools have in persuading... Dis okay, so yeah, if you can provide some examples of when um, petitions have persuaded decision makers to change course. So I think that there's a couple of ways in which this happens. So the first is... Um, a petition can spotlight an issue that a decision maker just simply wasn't aware of. Mm -hmm. This happens surprisingly frequently. Decision makers have a hard job, right? They're balancing all sorts of different things. Right. Um, and so by simply calling attention to an issue and spotlighting it, that's enough to kind of lead to some sort of change. Often, though, it's the addition of two things that make the most difference. So the first is the personal stories behind the person who organised the petition and the signatures behind it as well. It's kind of not enough just to be like, oh, there's a meaning, nameless one person who added their name to this. Instead, it's right. about hearing about the personal story of, like, why this matters. Um, and that turning abstract numbers of petition signatures into real stories um, of how people are affected by different issues is extremely compelling to decision makers. The second thing is to... Um, uh, help focus the activities of those signatures mm -hmm. into additional actions, like calling the decision maker, showing up to events. Right. Um, those are the additional things that also make petitions really powerful. Cool. All right. Well, um, 
Colin asks, can you talk about trust and safety at change.org? What's the main trend of user-generated content you are fighting against? That's a good question. It's a great question. And it, it varies. It changes a lot over time and mm -hmm. changes a lot by different national context. Um, we try to balance three things. Um, we want our community to be empowering, mm -hmm. um, open, and safe um, in the way that we uh, essentially protect a safe space for people to have a voice. Uh, the biggest trend um, over the last few years was obviously COVID, yep. um, where we had to react really fast, honestly, to try and make sure that things weren't, that wasn't misinformation spreading through the platform. Um, and uh, I'm really proud of the way that our, our trust and safety team worked on that, actually. We acted much faster than many of the other like, tech platforms on this. Um, Can you give an example? I mean, just like what kind of misinformation somebody was trying to petition? Yeah, so like uh, uh, vaccine safety is a good example of this, right? right, right, right. Um, where um, there was a bunch of misinformation, or I don't know, 5G, Bill Gates, like there's all mm -hmm. sorts of conspiracy theories mm -hmm. out there that um, were that we had to act really fast on to try and make sure that we were not being a kind of platform for that. Excellent. Uh, cool. So, lots of questions. This is awesome. I think this is the most we've had for an in conversation. Donna is asking, is email still a functional and worthwhile channel for digital activism? I mean, people have been predicting the death of email for like 15, 20 years. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, I still find it useful. Uh, I don't exactly. know about you guys. Uh, so, a huge amount of number of our community regularly find out about um, the campaigns that they can support through the email channel. So. Um, we kind of have somewhere in the range of a, a billion recommendations a month going out to different wow. members of our community um, with email as a primary channel. Um, it's definitely uh, not as effective as it used to be, um, but there's not a better alternative. Like mm. the alternative is to try and be, is to kind of put yourself at the whims of the algorithms of various social media platforms. You know, some people are building up S SMS platforms, um, but that's expensive and it costs a lot of money to distribute. So. Um, even though email has declined in absolute value, it's still, I think, one of the best channels for any organisation, um, organising a community of people to be investing in. Yeah, and there's a second life now with the popularity of newsletters. Yeah, absolutely. And are you guys involved in that kind of um, Yeah, platform? I mean, that's yeah. it kind of goes to this uh, uh, trend that I, that I was mm. talking about before of these individual, like, leaders who are kind of building up profiles by themselves and not, not associated with organisations, often they're doing that by building up audiences through email, newsletters. We see them using platforms like Substack or Patreon right. or things like that. Um, so that's very much something that we're looking to enable as well. Very cool. Okay, next question. Let's see. Laura says, after 10 years of emails and petitions, emails again, what trends will we be talking about in organizing technology 10 years from now? And I think that's kind of like, a, what's the future of change.org, right? Yeah, so I couldn't be more excited about this, um, the, the new voices that are coming to the table as a result of this, dis, uh, of this disaggregation and uh, decentralization of the, the new civic leaders that are finding their voice. These are the Greta's, the Malala's, mm -hmm. um, Parkland students. Yeah. Um, uh, again and again, we're seeing these kind of new leaders emerging. And I think that that's something that is incredibly um, exciting. It's bringing a more diverse set of voices to the table. It is bringing a more diverse set of like theories of change for how you create change in the world. It's not about using the same old tactics that mm -hmm. like a small set of organisations have used forever. Um, and I think that trend is only going to continue. I think that um, in the same way we are seeing in media um, this trend of uh, journalists essentially um, becoming uh, production companies themselves, yeah. individuals. They become brands. They become brands. We're going to see that in, in activism and organising. And I think that that's going to lead to a much more diverse set of voices at the table and a much more diverse set of theories of change for how um, different issues get taken forwards. That's something that I'm incredibly excited about. The other um, kind of big trend, I think, is in 10 years' time, I don't know about you, but I'm... I'm overwhelmed when I think about how can I personally take action on climate change? <laughs> like, yes, yes. <laughs> like there are, there are a thousand petitions signed, there are a hundred thousand organisations to Absolutely. donate to, um, and there's a lot of noise. 
Um, and that is both exciting because I can look through everything and I can go, here is an organisation doing something I'm incredibly inspired by. They're based in Africa, they're organising on the ground and I can back them directly and be connected to them directly in a way that wasn't possible before. So that's like the exciting part. The hard part is that's really overwhelming. There's a lot of noise to cut through. And Do you think that's the big challenge for, for change.org? I mean, it's something that we're definitely thinking about how we can help our users with, yeah. which is out of all of the opportunities that are out there, which one is like most relevant for you and how do you cut through and identify the things that are most impactful. Um, and I think there's a lot of other really interesting organisations doing similar things that are essentially solving the problem of identifying the most impactful action that you can take. GiveWell, I think, is actually a really good example. Mm. I don't know if you're, you're, the audience knows about this, but they do really great work looking through all of the organisations that are doing work to um, fight extreme poverty, essentially, mm -hmm. and saying, out of all of the possible opportunities to donate, what has the highest impact? Right. And saying, like, here are the top three. Here's where we think your money should go. And as a result of their recommendations, literally hundreds of millions of dollars get channeled towards these highly effective organisations. And I think we're going to see more of that over time, not just for donations, but mm -hmm. also for advocacy actions, also for volunteering. Right. That is about helping people cut through the noise and identify what is most impactful for them personally. Got it. I think we have time for just one question. So let me check. And um, and you know what? I'm going to end on, on asking you about the biggest challenge that you think change.org is going to be facing in the next decade. What's the thing that really kind of worries you and say, oh, we need to really work on that and make sure that this works? Yeah, so this might be a slightly wonky answer, but mm. we have increasing amounts of attention and time being captured and utilised by essentially monopoly technology platforms that are very closed gardens. I mean, you're, you mentioned TikTok. I mean, TikTok is a great, great example. Great activists, uh, you know, communicating there, but you can also just spend six hours watching, watching, I don't know, people dancing. Absolutely. Which is great, but... And they're very closed ecosystems, mm -hmm. right? Like, I think if we go back to a previous iteration of the internet and the technology, um, people would coordinate, but they would also post links, they would share opportunities for action, and it was very possible to go out and take action somewhere else as a result. Instagram, TikTok, some of the most popular technology platforms these days, Snapchat is another good example, are very focused around keeping you within the ecosystem, um, which can be great for education, content, and so on, but makes it really hard to inspire people to take action elsewhere. And I think that's something both for us, but also the industry more broadly, we need to be really careful of because it's going to be increasingly hard on those platforms to get people to take action outside of them. And that, I think, is a challenge for us and for everyone to overcome. Well, on that note, Nick, thank you so much for joining us in the studio. I hope everyone out there thought that was a fantastic talk. I certainly learned a lot. Have a good day and stay engaged.